Coming up next on Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable, we'll have the latest on the governor's budget and Medicaid expansion plans, and the Senate decides against a bill that makes it easier to recall elected officials. Those stories and more next on the Journalists Roundtable. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable. I'm Ted Simons. Joining me tonight are Mary Jo Pitzel of the Arizona Republic, Howard Fisher of Capital Media Services, and Jim Small from the Arizona Capital Times. Budget negotiations and Medicaid expansion talks continue at the state capitol, at least we would like to think they continue at the state capitol. What's going on? Oh, they're continuing. It's just a question of where and at what level. And the best we can tell, it, most of this discussion is still happening at the staff level, especially on the budget. Um, with Medicaid, I think a lot of that discussion is happening within the, the House and the Senate chambers as they try to figure out what their positions are going to be on that. Things moving forward, though? Are you hearing things are happening? Or are they just, is it just kind of, uh, you know? I, I, we were talking in the press room. It's a bit like a plane that took off and it's just circling yes. and circling and circling. And, and the problem becomes is that lining up the Republican votes. And you've got folks peeling off on all sides. I mean, you know, we understand why the, the, the conservatives don't like it, you know, the federal deficit and, quote, Obamacare. But then you've got people like Michelle Reagan who say, this is opposed by Scottsdale Healthcare. They are the largest employer in my district. And so she said, I'm not signing on to anything that they oppose. So building that, that group of Republicans to go along with the Democrats, assuming most of the Dems go along, remains difficult. Are things peeling off more than they did originally? What, what's, what kind of uh, progress or lack thereof? Uh, it, it seems in the past several weeks, uh, you know, maybe the past month, it, the momentum uh, has, has seemingly been with, with the critics. You know, you, you've had, I, and, and I think a lot of the, the people who've peeled off have, have essentially been because of some of the social conservative issues. I mean, there's a, a, an issue that was raised by the Center for Arizona Policy that, well, this, this money could give, basically help subsidize abortions. Can't, technically, you can't spend the money on abortions. Uh, groups like Planned Parenthood do take some small amount of Medicaid money, and, and the argument is that by them getting that money, it, it, at the end it keeps the lights on, keeps the doors open, which in turn allows them to perform, per, to perform services that they don't like. And so that, is, that has peeled off several Republicans, especially in the House. Mm -hmm. and, and so the, there's a challenge now and, and, and an effort to try to find a way to put some language somewhere into state law that would make it clear that, that, but, that this isn't allowed, but at the same time not repeat what's already been struck down by a federal court. And that's the key. This same language was put into a Medicaid bill last year, said that if you perform abortions, you are disqualified from any Medicaid funding. And the federal judge, Neil Wake, who is no flaming liberal, said, no, that's not what federal law says. And so this idea that, well, maybe we should audit Planned Parenthood's books, I mean, the, to the extent you shove that kind of stuff in there, there go your Democrats. Regardless of whether or not it's, it's legal, what does it do as far as the dynamics of the vote? Well, it, it makes it hard. It, make, it, it gives, in a way, easy cover for Republicans who are on the fence to say, mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't vote for this. Although it does beg the question that if, if this would be a problem, then you should just not fund the whole access program in the state because that's, this is just expanding what's already there. And so, but nobody's, except for Andy say. Biggs, is voting to, you know, uh, introducing bills to do away with access. He, he <laughs> has, I mean, to, to be consistent. Um, so it's, it's, it's just helped to muddy the waters. But it's also, you know, given, as Howie was saying, it, it has given something that perhaps it could negotiate around to try to bring people back on board if you can sort of tamp down the concerns that, that Medicaid expansion would would fuel abortions. How, I've asked this question to numerous folks. Uh, let me ask it to you guys. Let's say it doesn't pass. Mm -hmm. There is no Medicaid expansion. The deal is off. What does the state of it, what are the state's options? Well, there aren't a lot. A lot of it then becomes, you go back to the Center for Medicaid Studies and you say, look, we have a waiver that allows us to use federal funds for uh, childless adults. That disappears at the end of this year because the assumption was, well, we're going to have this expanded program. Well, now you go back and say, look, we've tried, but can we at least get the federal money for the childless adults? What the Obama administration will say, I don't know. On one hand, they're not suggesting that now because they really want to push the 133% of the federal poverty level. Otherwise, we're back to where we were. People get bounced off at the end of the year, the childless adults, the ones that are left, the, the, you know, the whatever's 
left of the rest of the program happens and the burden falls on the state. And the fact is that this comes back to where you started, the budget. The budget that the governor sent is built on the fact that if they can get 240, 250 million from the hospitals, that not only pays the state's share of the expansion, but it provides 100 million to backfill in the other costs. Without that money, now we've got another budget problem. But, but that is something that President Biggs says, that they're working on options on what that they could present to the governor on what they w would do if without doing Medicaid expansion. And you know, at the end of the day, it comes down to taking money out of the general fund. And is there a way to do that? And, and if you keep the freeze on, on the people that are um, eligible for the um, access program, over time, that number's going to get smaller and smaller and you know eventually go to zero. But that also assumes that the federal government allows us to keep the freeze on, because it's not, you know, the, the right. waiver that Howie's talking about, when that expires, that, mm -hmm. that gives us this two-to-one matching money for this population. But, you know, and the federal government did allow us to put that freeze into place, but whether they allow Arizona to keep that freeze in place long term or say, no, you've got to, you have to open this program back up and those 150,000 people who have been removed from the rolls, suddenly you've got to pay for them out of the state's general fund, that's going to be an issue. And I think what happens, if the Medicaid expansion goes down, and the federal government eventually says in October, no, we're not going to do this. We're back here in special session around Thanksgiving to sit with the governor saying, okay, look, kids, we know what the options are. Got one more shot at it. Is that why the governor's office put out some new Medicaid figures as to what would happen if nothing were done? I mean, it sounds to me like this was a way to, to kind of poke a little bit and say, by the way. Oh, yes. I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a way to sort of stir the pot. Um, very interesting, the numbers that came from the governor's office, which shows um, a higher cost to the state if you don't do expansion. It's vastly higher than what the legislative um, mm -hmm. office is putting out in, in those numbers. So lots of, uh, lots of space in between those numbers. All right. Uh, speaking of uh, medicine and such, the Senate now <laughs> seems to have revived this mm -hmm. medical pricing bill. What happened to the bill in the first place? Why did it need to be revived? Well, the idea is very basic. It says you want to have your car fixed, you go into Pep Boys, it says the oil changes so much, transmission so much. Well, the same sort of thing, you know, I want to go in for an x-ray, I want to go in for a CAT scan, it should be publicly available. You know, the, the, the bill went out, not a lot of opposition, and all of a sudden the governor said, well, you know, wait a second, there are problems with it. It, it, it would apply to federal hospitals where it can't apply. It would prohibit uh, hospitals from offering discounts, uh, and it might make it hard for us to do price investigations. I think there was a little bit of uh, looking for an excuse, uh, given that the sponsor is not a big fan of, of Medicaid. So the sponsor said, okay, I'll take out the federal hospitals, I'll take out the Indian Health Service, I'll make it clear that hospitals can offer discounts. Okay, Governor, now what? Uh, and so what will the Governor likely do? Well, we don't know. I mean, the bill, the bill got amended, uh, as Howie's talking about. It got tacked onto another bill. That bill hasn't come up for a final vote in the Senate. Um, I, I think you can, you can kind of draw some conclusions as to why that hasn't happened yet. Uh, but, but if you look to the past, you know, two years ago, Republicans did the same thing with the Governor. They sent her a bill for tax credits for private school scholarships. She vetoed it, and they said, well, we don't like that. So they went ahead and they tacked a, they, same thing, they addressed her concerns, they lowered the cost of it, tacked it onto an IRS conformity bill, just an annual exercise the legislature does, and she vetoed it with a kind of a snarky little letter that said, oh, and by the way, don't think I didn't notice that you put this onto a bill that we really need, so now you can go back to work and go fix this bill. I was going to say, they, they ch change things in the bill, but the hospital association, health care providers, they still don't like it, do they? No, they don't. They don't. No, they don't. And so that might be um, if this bill actually does get back up to the governor again, and I think there is an if on that, mm -hmm. um, th that might give you an idea of where the governor might come from. Look, I think the hospital association is making way too much out of this. Do I realize there are multiple rates? Look, nobody pays the bill charges. You know, nobody is paying the $14 for the aspirin or anything else. The insurance companies negotiate charges. Even as an individual payer, you can negotiate discounts. Medicare doesn't pay, pay the rate. So, but you have a book rate. It is there. What is the great problem of saying that our standard bill charge, of which we can negotiate discounts, is X number of dollars for an X-ray, X number of dollars for a CAT scan? But the, I don't, for whatever reason, the hospitals, I, you know, for, for all that talk about transparency and how transparency helps Medicaid expansion and everything else, 
Not so much for us. It sounds like their concerns are that those standard prices aren't so standard even within a single hospital when it comes to charity donations, when it comes to insurance payouts, when it comes to actually but, ad ad adjusting for a single parent, a single patient. Uh, those prices, you, can, you can't say it's X because it's X all over the place. But it doesn't, but, but the fact is somewhere in their books they have the standard charge. Are there, you know, somebody from... Uh, Blue Cross comes in, here's the discount. Somebody from Medicare comes in, here's the discount. Somebody from, you know, from Medicaid comes in, here's the discount. There is a book charge there. Yeah, but, I'm if, sorry. but if the book charge doesn't make any sense, it, it if does, it, and so especially to a, well, to a consumer that's confused about medical pricing to begin with, I think that that would make a difference. Well, but you, you can at least have the starting point that if I know that, that, that Phoenix Children's Hospital charges X and Mayo charges Y, at least as a starting point, at least lets me ask the question. I, I think it is. It's a way to start that conversation. I'm like, well, then why isn't there? Mm -hmm. You know, a standard going rate for, you know, a non-emergency. I mean, not, emergencies are sort of a different yeah. kettle of fish, but, you know, for your a standard colonoscopy, you know. Yeah. Well, all right. We'll see where it goes. Uh, it's just very interesting to see that uh, it may not even get there. And if it does, we may see a, uh, <laughs> um, a, a, a militia. Mm -hmm. for, if you're over the age of 45, you apparently can't volunteer for the state Mali what the state you, 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 the they, national well, what are we talking well, about here? Well, understand that there's really two different terms here. There is a state militia which consists of the National Guard, retired guard members, and the quote unquote unorganized militia. All of us, well actually I'm too old for it. We won't we'll, we'll get back to that. But all Maybe of us you're are not, Howie. But well all of us are any able bodied person between eighteen and forty five under current law is a member of that. Now Nobody has ever called out the unorganized militia. It's one of those constitutional provisions and statutory things that says if we need it. For some reason, Carl Seal felt the need to say, you know this militia we've never called out, this unorganized militia? You should be able to join up voluntarily at 46, or in my case, 62, because Lord knows my state needs me. The governor said, oh, come on now. <laughs> I don't know what confuses me most, that you're 62 or your state needs you. Well, <laughs> I think it's both, sir. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's going on here? I mean, is this just a way to get uh, the word militia out there and see who's... Yeah, I think it's just a way to keep... Um, I mean, the, the, this, as Howie said, this militia has never been activated. The governor is not a fan of this. Um, it's just a way to pump a little more air into it and draw a little more attention back to this dormant issue. And again, uh, mm -hmm. it, Representative Seal, not a big fan of Medicaid expansion. Um, that's putting it mildly, <laughs> yes, I think. Okay, I, I think we've, we've all seen the litany of daily floor speeches he's given yes. opposing it. So okay. that, again, may or may yeah. not have something to do with An Another happened. reason, perhaps. Um, okay, a gun buyback bill, Jim. This Cities have to buy back these guns and then melt them down, destroy them in one sh way, shape, or form. Now the state says no? Yeah, so the idea is a couple years ago there was a law that was passed that said law enforcement, when they seize a weapon, you know, a crime, someone, someone commits an armed robbery and the cops take the gun after the trial's over and they're going to dispose of the weapon, they, instead of destroying it, they have to sell it as long as it's a weapon that can legally be sold. So if it's, you know, say a, just a handgun, a Glock handgun, they'd have to turn around and sell it. If it's a sawed-off shotgun, they'd have to dispose of it because that's an illegal weapon. There was a loophole, though, apparently, where municipalities, non-law enforcement, but just the city government, could conduct a buyback program. Did it in, uh, Tucson Councilman did it, used city money to, to basically buy guns from people so that way they could destroy them. And that, it, that, that got under the skin of lawmakers who supported, supported the idea of not destroying weapons. And so the result was this bill that basically outlaws that practice yeah. and says you cannot use taxpayer dollars to, to basically run a, a gun buyback program. Well, and what's interesting is that on one hand, it's one of those Second Amendment fights. But on the other hand, Rick Murphy said, this isn't Second Amendment. If you come into possession of a valuable asset, why should you destroy it to make someone feel good. If it can be sold off for $200, why melt it down? Now the question then becomes, well, what if it had been Jared Loeffner's gun and whose hands are we putting it into? Now, of course, part of the problem with the arguments about a valuable asset is, so if we seize some marijuana, instead of destroying <laughs> it, we should sell it off to one of the dispensaries. Somehow I don't see Rick Murphy supporting well, that one. Except for the fact that marijuana is illegal. No. In, except for medical marijuana, yeah. but I mean, you know, marijuana is generally illegal in the state and firearms are not. I mean, yeah. that would be the obvious counter to that. What is the governor likely to do with this one? Because now, again, it, you know, on the face of it, mm -hmm. you, might, you might say, okay, makes sense, Second Amendment, all this sort of business. But this is, once again, the state meddling into municipal well, operations. Well, I think 60-40 she signs it. And the reason is the bill she's vetoed on local control had to do with 
bringing guns into county buildings, and she's been a county supervisor. What the, and if the counties don't want them there, then they have to have an armed guard, and they have to have metal detectors, and that's, that's an unfunded mandate. This is, remember, she signed the first bill about court destruction, the second bill, which was supposedly aimed at the cities, this simply closes that loophole. I don't see any reason why she suddenly says that surrendered weapons should be able to be melted down, but any other seized weapon is not. Okay. Um, the Senate also, and was this a surprise regarding the recall overhaul? Uh, we heard a lot about this. First of all, tell us about this bill. <laughs> and was it a surprise that the Senate said no? Yeah, this is a bill that um, Representative Steve Smith got through the House you know, quite easily. Um, and it takes the recall well, on a party line vote, pretty much. Um, and it, it takes the recall election, which is one election, and it cuts it in two. And it says, okay, we're going to have a primary and we're going to have a general. And so this bill comes over to the Senate and they have a big, long debate. And then Senator Yarborough stands up and says, well, wait a minute, we need to amend this because we've got to to keep this constitutional, we have to make sure that the recalled official um, it participates in both the primary and the general, which sort of begs the question of, well, then why have a primary if you've got to get them to the general, which also says that really the intent of the recall is that the recall election is the general election. So it, it got sort of confusing, um, but, you know, and, and you know, Senator Gallardo stood up and said, look, this is such an overhaul. If, if this is so important, let's, we should put it on the ballot and let the voters decide. Big, long uh, uh, floor debate. It passed on a voice vote. When it came up for the formal vote, um, seven Republicans peeled off and joined the Democrats to, to defeat it. Um, nobody really said much of anything uh, about why, but it, it's, it's cumbersome. It, it does. It adds more time and length to uh, the recall process, and it's confusing. And well, the other piece of it: look at the Republicans who peeled off. Remember, this all started because of the Russell Pierce recall. The argument of Steve Smith was that if Russell Pierce had a face-off against Jerry Lewis in a Republicans-only primary, Russell would have survived, and then any Democrat who came up would have been defeated. The recall single election allowed the Republicans to unite with Democrats and independents behind Jerry Lewis and defeat Russell, which is why they wanted the dual primary. Look at the people who, who voted, you know, Rich Crandall, Bob Worsley, who's only in politics because of the fact that he defeated Russell's attempt. But in a regular uh, election. In, in a regular election, but, but, be, but people like Steve Pierce. Yes. This is not the, uh, the, the great, um, you know, Russell Pierce fan club. Now, the other piece of it is, talk about a bridge too far, they made the bill so it would theoretically be retroactive to January 1st. Gee, where, what, what recall has been started since January 1st? So we got, we got the Russell Pierce nod, we've got the Joe Arpaio nod, but mm -hmm. we also had uh, Don Shooter basically uh, voting against why, so he can revive this thing later on? Is that That's what it, exactly that, it. You, yeah. There's a procedural yeah. thing, and Jim knows this too. It's a, yeah. You have to be on the prevailing side to make a motion to reconsider. That motion will come on Monday. Uh, even if they agree to the motion to allow reconsideration, you still have to, you've got way too many votes to line up. I don't know, uh, you know, short of twisting somebody's arm, I don't know, Jim, you know, you think anybody's going to suddenly vote for this? I, I mean, there might be a couple more that they, that they get, but I mean, you know, when you lose seven Republican votes, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a tough hill to climb. It really is. Uh, speaking of Don Shooter, um, <laughs> it sounds like Yuma PD mm -hmm. is recommending charges. Is that the idea? Yes, yesterday they closed their investigation and sent over a recommendation to the city prosecutor that uh, Shooter be prosecuted on four charges, uh, I'm going to trespass, assault, um, disorderly conduct and disrupting the, uh, or interfering with the educational institution. So this is now in the hands of the city prosecutor who's probably going to take a, a, up to a month to review this and can do, um, use prosecutorial dis discretion to uh, decide if these should go forward or not or do their own investigation. And this involves an incident at uh, his grandson's charter school, barged into the schoolroom and allegedly confronted the teacher and then there were yeah. th uh, threatening actions, claimed his teenage son was being bullied. Um, again, Yuma police recommending, these are misdemeanor charges, mm -hmm. but recommending nonetheless. So the ethics investigation begins when, Howie? Well, <laughs> this has been interesting because in some previous incidents, we haven't waited for an arrest, you know, the Scott Bungard thing. Uh, I think there's, there are a lot of lawmakers who want to see what, what shakes out, particularly after some people say they rush to judgment on other things. I think the other piece of it is there's a difference between Don Shooter and Scott Bungard. Don is liked by his colleagues because he's sort of a good time guy. You know, he, he's, he's a nice guy. He sh showed up one day in, in a Serape with, with, with holsters with two bottles of tequila uh, during a special session. 
I, and and they, they, I think they're more willing to give him the benefit of the doubt than they were you know, Scott Bungard. What do you think, Jim? I mean, is, is there going to be some sort of ethics probe here? Well, there will probably be a complaint filed. I would imagine at some point, you know, the Democrats are going to file a complaint against him. But uh, whether, whether the ethics committee takes it up or, 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 I mean, they don't even have to take it up right away. I mean, a complaint could be filed and they can sit on it and wait. And, and Senator Yarbrough, uh, who's the chair of the ethics committee, said that he's not going to, he, he has the ability to proactively go out and initiate an investigation, but he's not going to. He's going to wait until a complaint is filed. And, you know, the big difference between this one and the Bungard one and, and the Daniel Patterson one is, you know, there was no real violence in this incident. I mean, there, there, he barged into a school and was angry and, and, you know, perhaps verbally abusive or allegedly verbally abusive, but, but there was no violence. I mean, the, you know, we didn't get calls to 911 saying there's, you know, there, there are two people fighting on the side of the road or cops weren't called to, you know, because there was a domestic dispute, which is what we saw in those last two. So police recommending charges is still uh, a, a bar too high. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's an interesting yeah. question. I mean, look, we're talking about, uh, you know, class one and class two misdemeanors. Uh, the maximum penalty is six months in jail and, and, and a fine. And I'm not saying that, that, that you should have to be convicted of a crime to be unethical. Um, you know, part of the other issue is sometimes you get people, one of the issues with the Bungard case became, the allegations he was saying, you can't arrest me, I'm a lawmaker. Right. And the use of that. Now, mm -hmm. Shooter has not, as far as everything we've seen, said to anybody, you can't arrest me, I'm a lawmaker. And I think that becomes part of the issue. I think that, you know, as, and I agree with Jim, I suspect you know, Democrats at some point will at least file a, a complaint. But it, this is the problem of an in-house ethics committee. I mean, they're effectively policing themselves, and I think the public, you know, looking at it from the outside says, where's the accountability? It's, it's, it's much harder to enforce these rules on yourself. Perhaps it makes the case for having an independent mm. ethics commission that, that's done in many other states. Arizona's tended to keep it in-house. And the likelihood of that happening? It would probably have to come from external forces. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, Howie, we can't have a journalist roundtable with you here and not discuss uh, something regarding medical marijuana, you being the proverbial child of yes. the 60s. So yes. what do you got for us this week? Well, this is an interesting issue. Uh, we know that there are several lawsuits out there dealing with the question of whether there's federal preemption of state marijuana laws. One is this interesting case out of Yuma where the woman had a medical marijuana card. She was stopped by Border Patrol. They seized some marijuana. The Border Patrol turned it over to the sheriff's office. The sheriff's office figured out, well, you know, she's got a card, but wouldn't give her back her drugs. The second one is this fight over the White Mountain dispensary in, in Glendale and whether the county has to issue the paperwork necessary for zoning. And the argument of the prosecutors, including the prosecuting attorney's advisory council, is the state can't do this. It is field preempted in terms of federal law. You can't regulate something that is contrary to federal law. Right. Yet at the same time, the prosecutors have been lobbying for bill to regulate the packaging of marijuana, the brownies, the, the lollipops, the sodas, to make sure they don't look like candy. And it suddenly occurred to Sheila Polk, who's the, uh, the Yavapai County, uh, County, uh, County, County Attorney, uh, well, wait a second. Aren't we sort of undermining our cases in court, uh, saying we can't regulate when we're pushing a bill to regulate? So basically, the marijuana packaging measure is dead. I think they're going to let the court cases play out, and we're going to find out exactly how far the state can go. Will anything regarding medical marijuana go forward from here, considering the court cases? I mean, it, it's... No, it's the, well, the, 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 there was the other bill about the return of the marijuana. That also has been held. Yeah. Look, the Supreme Court is going to deal with this. They're going to have to decide what is the authority of the voters of Arizona to enact a medical marijuana scheme in light of it being a Schedule One drug, which the federal government says there's no medical use for. And some point, we're going to get some definitive laws. All right, and that is definitively the end of our show. Good to have you all here. Thanks for joining us. Monday on Arizona Horizon, should health care providers be required to post their prices for common medical procedures? We'll hear both sides of the issue. And Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton joins us to discuss a variety of issues facing his city. That's Monday evening, 5.30 and 10.00 on Arizona Horizon. Tuesday, renowned ASU physicist Lawrence Krauss talks about a newly discovered Earth-like planets and other science news. Wednesday is our weekly legislative update with the Arizona Capital Times. Thursday, APS responds to a poll that shows support for solar energy in Arizona. And Friday, it's another edition of the Journalists' Roundtable. That is it for now.
I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great weekend. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.